Okay, ready to start. All right. ContraPoints is one of the most popular philosophy-related channels. It's intelligent, eloquently scripted. The presenter has a philosophy background. It's well-performed and elaborately produced by maybe a little better than ours. Uh, the host, Natalie Wynn, is a transgender woman. Uh, and transgender and gender issues are central to many of her videos. And most uh, of them are actually published like two or three years ago. As one of the most influential transgender influencers, uh, she has millions of viewers. And today I want to suggest an answer to the question, what is gender identity, through a discussion of ContraPoint's video on this very topic. Uh, one thing, beyond the cultural wars, uh, for ContraPoint's politics and morality are central. But my interest here is different. I'm interested in something like a philosophy of identity, and I'm trying to work toward an existentialism of the 21st century. Now, what is gender identity? At one point, ContraPoint expresses a critical awareness of the fuzziness of this notion. All this talk about gender identity, a lot of the time, I don't really get it either. Now, my aim here is to clarify this confusion with ContraPoint's help. Now, to start with, I have a basic agreement with ContraPoint's that goes somewhat against the mainstream. Gender cannot be essentially or substantially defined. I reject a gender metaphysics. And when ContraPoint's says she doesn't get it, she rejects ontological, neurological, and metaphysical supposedly true determinations of gender. Here's what she says. Am I really truly a woman ontologically, neurologically, metaphysically? Well, honestly, I don't even know what that would mean. There is no essence to gender. There isn't something essentially unchanging, forever fixed, a priori determined, eternal male or female. And attempts to define gender beyond all cultural and historical contexts is a useless endeavor. Some bullshit semantic debate about what is a real woman. This is metaphysics, and life is too short for metaphysics. ContraPoints is very clear here. She says, So I personally don't believe in any gender metaphysics at all. In a strict, essential sense, there is no true gender. Gender is not something that defines people on an ontological level of being. It's not something one truly is for once and for all. Importantly, if there's no gender metaphysics, there is also no gender theology. Gender is not God-given. And therefore, ContraPoints also speaks out against any scholastic, scholastic gender, gender theology. theology. Moreover, there is not just no God-given gender. Gender is not even, in a secularized version, something that one is fundamentally born with. ContraPoint says, I wasn't born a woman. I was born a fucking baby. So if there's no gender theology, then gender is not sacrosanct. It's neither of divine origin, nor is it an unalienable value. It's, in practice, contingent and negotiable. In this context, ContraPoint speaks out against what she calls feminine, feminine essence, essence theory. theory. The feminine essence theory says that trans women are female souls and male bodies, that we are women from birth to death, and that transition is merely an effort to make our accidental exterior match our essential interior. ContraPoints here talks about trans female gender, but I think her criticism can be generally applied to any form of gender essence theory. A gender essence theory would say something like this, namely, gender is an essential and therefore immutable interior quality of the soul or brain or mind or spirit of a person. So gender is an essential quality of the true self. I guess it's safe to say that ContraPoints rejects such a gender essence theory. And I reject it too. And the main reason why I reject it is that I don't think that there's a true self to begin with. Now, here's a second fundamental agreement with ContraPoint. Chromosomal sex is biologically conditioned. And there are, broadly speaking, from a chromosomal perspective, only two sexes, male and female. 
Contrapoint says, No trans person thinks it's possible to change chromosomal sex. So when transphobes say sex is real, they're not actually contradicting anything most trans people believe. We can simply quote Wikipedia here. In most mammals, females are XX and can pass along either of the Xs. Since males are XY, they can pass along either an X or a Y. So babies are not born essentially male or female. They are born with either male or female chromosomal sex. Yes, there are intersex phenomena as well, but they are very rare exceptions. So this brings us to what Simone de Beauvoir already indicated in the 1940s. We need to distinguish between sex on the biological level of chromosomes and gender on different levels, especially on the psychological and social level, as well as on the cultural and historical level. When de Beauvoir famously claimed that one is not born but becomes a woman, she referred to gender. On the one hand, she affirms natural, inborn, male-female biological sex differences, but at the same time she regards gender as a social psychological construct. And this is confirmed by contrapoints. When we say that someone is a trans man or a trans woman, we're talking about psychological and social identity. So, yes, there is a true or biologically factual sex. And it is, at least as of yet, immutable. However, gender is something different from sex. And it is potentially subject to psychological and social and even bodily transformations. So here's a short summary of the main points. No gender theology. No God-given gender. No gender metaphysics either. No essential gender. No eternal feminine or eternal male. And importantly, no gender metapsychology either. There is no gendered soul. Is there literally such a thing as a male soul trapped in a female body or vice versa? I personally don't believe there is, but I'm a little biased. I sold my soul to a Sudanese businessman and all I got in return was this shitty ketamine habit. There is no gendered soul. Soul is a metaphor, but nothing real. Instead, we need a conceptual distinction between biologically conditioned chromosomal sex and psychologically and socially contingent gender. So, in a strict sense, there is no gender identity. There's no correct gender role that corresponds exactly to a person's biology. And there are multiple ways of feeling, for instance, male or female. Gender identity is incongruent or dissonant. This is somewhat comparable to what we could call age identity. Age identity, too, is dissonant and incongruent. Like, I never feel really identical with my age. I'm not gonna tell you what my age is, but please believe me, I often feel that I am actually somewhat younger than my body biologically is. And also, the social aspects of my age don't really correspond to how I feel about my age. Now, I'm not saying that gender and age are the same thing, but I do think that in both cases, an incongruity and a dissonance of identity is palpable. There's no perfect match between one's sex, one's gender roles, and how one feels about one's gender. The relation between sex and gender is contingent. One can be male or female in multiple different ways. And these ways can and do change for any individual during their lifetime. Like, it's different to be male as a child, as a teenager, as a grown-up, or as an old man. And of course, historically and socially, what it means to be a man or woman also changes big time. Now, gender identity is not identical. Chromosomes, thoughts, and social gender are not perfectly in line. There's always some sort of tension, a certain degree of difference between them. And unfortunately, this tension can be extreme and painful. Transgender people, like contrapoints, often suffer from gender dysphoria, a strong dissonance or incongruity between chromosomal sex, gendered body, and the gendered social persona, and inner feelings about one's gender. This is what ContraPoint says. 
Gender dysphoria is a state of social, emotional, anatomical, sexual, spiritual, and sartorial angst relating to one's assigned birth sex, which is mostly relieved by socially and medically transitioning to the gender of one's psychological identity. This is what motivated me to transition, and I endorse the mainstream scientific view. So, moreover, the body has always been gendered as well. It's not simply reducible to biological sex. Biological features relate to gender. But today, due to developments in science and medicine, the gendered body is changeable to quite an extent. Beyond the chromosomal level, bodily features indicating gender can be altered, like through hormones or surgery, for instance. So, to sum up, gender identity is a social, psychological, bodily construct. We may call it a narrative. Despite all these incongruities, the dissonances and contingencies, despite the non-perfect match of the different aspects of gender and sex, this narrative suggests to both individuals and society at large that a specific gender is part of every single person's identity. It's a central aspect of who one is. And the narrative suggests counterfactually unity, essence, congruity of the gender itself. People identify as and are identified as in terms of gender. And that is very important and even indispensable. We couldn't have an identity in the way we have it if it wouldn't be gendered. Everybody must be gendered. Now, as viewers of this channel will maybe know, in my view, there are several identity technologies to construct this necessary sense of identity. This sense of who one is. This narrative that covers up the factual incongruity and dissonance. So that we can live with it. And these technologies are also applicable to gender. The first technology is sincerity, an orientation to social roles. In the case of gender, an orientation to traditional gender roles. The second technology is authenticity. It means the pursuit of originality. It finds identity in individual selfhood. One is supposed to find one's true self below the mass of social roles. And then there's prophylicity. Identity construction through the curation, the display, and the social validation of profiles. Let's talk about gender sincerity. People used to shape a sense of their gender identity in orientation through gendered social roles of man or woman. In the family, this could be wife and husband, or mother and father. In religion, it could be nun and monk. And in a sincerity society, it could also be tied to professions like whatever, warrior and nurse. All these roles can be, they don't have to be, but they can be strongly gendered. And then in sincerity, gender identity basically consists in sincere commitment, kind of devotion to these gendered roles. This is then typically also tied to a morality, to certain gendered values, like Honor is perceived as a commitment to gender roles. To just give one of myriad examples, in ancient China, uh, this goes back to the Han Dynasty 2000 years ago, there was a book called Biographies of Exemplary Women, Lian Nujuan. It's a compilation of stories about female role models. For instance, they don't remarry after their husband's death or stuff like this. So typically, Gender sincerity comes with gender metaphysics or gender theology or gender metapsychology. The biographies of the exemplary women, for instance, are supposed to show what ideal femininity is. Interestingly, ContraPoints mentions a case of what I would call transgender sincerity. Some cultures have ancient third gender traditions, such as the Hydra of South Asia, a legally recognized gender in India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Interestingly, ContraPoints mentions a case of what I would call transgender under conditions of sincerity. Third genders, such as the Hijra, 
who ContraPoints talks about here, in traditional societies are typically tied to very strict gender roles. They're not open to any individual who can freely choose them. Hijras are socially very low. They are typically born males, and the community functions somewhat similar to a caste. Role expectations are strict, stable over time, and there's a strong conformity demand. What a hijra is, can do, how they live, is in accordance with the gender role hijra. So, third genders are also often based on a sort of gender theology, a gender metaphysics, or gender metapsychology. Right? It's supposed that God made them like this, that they have, for instance, a hirja essence or soul. Typically, today's transgender discourse, including that of contrapoints, does not advocate transgender as a third gender role. It certainly does not demand that transgender people commit to rigidly defined gender expectations. Therefore, I think it would be quite a grave mistake to idealize traditional third genders. They typically function under conditions of sincerity in strict orientation to strict roles. However, there are still advocates of gender sincerity in the postmodern West. One recent example is Mary Harrington, a popular reactionary feminist and author of the book Feminism Against Progress. She is a good example of what could be called new sincerity. She argues that the family, the traditional family, is still needed. She defends Article 41.2 in the Irish Constitution, which goes, by her life within the home, woman gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. This, according to Harrington, is a profoundly humane provision for the unique nature of mothering, which, according to her, is now vanishingly rare in developed world legislation. Moreover, she advocates some sort of sex asymmetry and a kind of gender metaphysics. She's against new cyborg technologies, which, according to her, alter the natural sex, which she regards as a threat. So obviously, gender sincerity and a sincere notion of gender identity is politically very different from ContraPoint's point of view. So, interestingly, uh, ContraPoints is not just implicitly against gender sincerity, but also explicitly against gender authenticity. Gender authenticity, I propose, found its classic expression in Simone de Beauvoir's work. She's, so to speak, the mother of gender authenticity. Gender authenticity argues against gender as gender roles. It wants to overcome gender roles to allow for sovereign individuality that transcends gender. According to Beauvoir, gender roles prevent women and men from becoming authentic individuals. So, for the sake of developing authentic individuality, gender roles have to be overcome. Or, in other words, for the authentic individual, gender is inessential. And personal identification in orientation to gender roles, for instance, husband or wife, is a sign of inauthenticity. Interestingly, in the intro to her famous book, The Second Sex, de Beauvoir writes, Dorothy Parker has written, I cannot be just to books, which treat of woman as woman. My idea is that all of us, men as well as women, should be regarded as human beings. By the way, Dorothy Parker was an American writer at the time. Uh, I've never been able to verify this quote. If someone can find it, that would be great. Anyway, what de Beauvoir does in her whole philosophical project is basically take this sentence and simply replace the expression human beings with the expression authentic individuals. Gender as gender roles impose a social conformity. And the point is to find one's individual authenticity by rejecting this conformity. 
Now, importantly, de Beauvoir acknowledges biological sex differences. She does not want to abolish gender completely, but move beyond gender roles. You should not want to be seen as woman, or as man for that matter, or as transgender, but you should simply be your authentic self. Be who you are. In a very critical video about TERFs, trans-exclusive radical feminists, ContraPoint attacks the notion of gender authenticity. She critically caricatures the quest for authenticity beyond gender by actually ascribing the demand to abolish gender to TERFs. But you should be moving beyond the patriarchal constructs of masculinity and femininity, not conforming to them. Real feminism aims to abolish gender, not reinforce it. Abolish gender? Well, that sounds like an ambitious project for one transsexual, but I mean, I'll give it a try. Solanus be praised. No nails, no makeup. I'm wearing a nice little gender neutral robe moment. I did it, everyone. I abolished gender. Well, I guess long hair is still a gender signifier, so I should probably get rid of that. How is she though? She's feeling a little genderless. I guess the way I position my body is still gendered and there's a gendered cadence to my voice. So what I'm gonna do is just hold my hands up genderlessly and speak in a genderless robot voice. My name is 5466417. I have no gender. Patriarchy is over. I guess English is still a patriarchal language, right? So I should probably be communicating with a series of genderless sounds. Near, 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 near. I can't stand this. Fuck this. I think that's a little bit unfair exaggeration of de Beauvoir and also of TERFs, who don't really want to abolish gender altogether, but more precisely abolish traditional gender roles. However, ContraPoints has a very valid point here. The idea that there is an authentic self beneath all the gender roles that transcends gender distinctions and is somehow gender neutral is indeed utopian. I agree with ContraPoints. Authentic identity that transcends gender completely does not really exist. And even if it existed, one couldn't identify with it in a thoroughly gendered society. Importantly, ContraPoints explicitly rejects the typical authenticity claim one often hears in transgender discourse. Just to give you one example, there's been a TV series, it's not that well known, it's titled Always Jane. It's about a transgender woman named Jane. And the title already emphasizes that Jane has always been a woman. Like, that's unchanging gender metaphysics. And that her new gender is her original self. And the TV series advertises her whole process of gender transition as a journey towards living authentically. I think, in McLuhan's terminology, this is a typical contemporary media rear-view mirror view. It describes profilicity with the old semantics of the past, namely the semantics of authenticity. Contrapoints, however, clearly rejects the popular authenticity narrative. I think of myself as a woman who used to be a man, rather than as always having been a woman. Now, finally, we get to gender profilicity. It's gender identity construction through the curation, display, and social validation of profiles. It's actually quite similar to how Judith Butler conceived of gender in her famous book, Gender Trouble, namely in terms of performativity. ContraPoints refers to Butler in a video. It's generally affirmative, but she also criticizes it as incomplete for political reasons. Let's listen. Are you going to try to make me read Judith Butler again? I'll summarize it. Gender is a series of gestures. It's called performativity. It's the way you dress. It's the way you speak. It's the way you act. It's the way you relate to other people. Through transitioning, we habituate to the gestures of womanhood, and socially, that makes us women, regardless of biology or psychology, checkmate transphobes. Okay, the problem with that is that it's both too exclusionary and too inclusive. It excludes a lot of trans people who can't transition for circumstantial reasons, but whose dysphoria is very real. And it includes every trans trender, drag queen, fetishist, and two-bit cross-dressing comedian in a dine wig. Uh, well, 
So ContraPoints argues here for a both more inclusive and exclusive understanding of transgender identity developed out of Butler's notion of performativity. I agree with that and I would call that, although it's obviously not a concept ContraPoint uses, she doesn't formulate any, gender profilicity. In many of her videos, ContraPoints speaks of her own gender identity in line with gender profilicity. She says that gender identity cannot be reduced only to inner psychology, to what people think their gender is. So again, she speaks out against gender metapsychology or gender authenticity. If psychological identity were the only thing that mattered, then there would be no need for a trans person to come out or do anything to transition, including requesting different pronouns, because pronouns belong to the social world of language, not to individual psychology. Instead, she says, but gender is also social, structural, and interpersonal. Interpersonal here means interpersonal validation. It means to be treated as a woman, for instance. You know, you don't become a woman the first time you put on a dress. You become a woman the first time an older female relative turns to you at a restaurant and says, maybe you should order the salad, sweetie. It also means, importantly, to be seen by the general peer in terms of how your gender is seen. Here's a beautiful quote from ContraPoints. We want not necessarily to pass perfectly, but at least to seem like our genders to the people around us. As Laura Jane Grace put it, you want them to see you like they see every other girl. So the scene as that Dorothy Parker and Simone de Beauvoir completely rejected to treat of woman as woman becomes, for contrapoints to the contrary, the gender-defining act. This is precisely the switch from authenticity to profilicity. Here's some more quotes specifying ContraPoint's gender profilicity. All I can really tell you is that I prefer to express myself with diaphanous feminine gestures, that taking female hormones and having feminizing medical procedures makes me feel more at home in my body, and that I like it when other people treat me as a woman, socially, spiritually, sexually. For her, gender identity is to be treated in a gendered way, socially, spiritually, sexually. Of course, importantly, on top of mere social validation of transgender people, ContraPoint also argues very forcefully for the political goal of transgender equality. That is politically central for her. I feel like trans culture is just so obsessed with reassuring ourselves that we are valid that we sometimes forget that the end goal of a political movement is not validity, it's equality. That's what we're supposed to be fighting for. So instead of asking, does JK Rowling think we're valid? Which like, who fucking cares if she thinks we're valid? Well, maybe I care a little bit. But instead, why don't we ask, is she or is she not an ally in our struggle for equality? However, in this video, I'm not focusing on the political struggle, but on an existential understanding of gender identity. And in that clip too, ContraPoints adds that she too cares about social validation by J.K. Rowling. Moreover, ContraPoints highlights that gender profile validation is especially important for extremely online trans people. Plus a lot of extremely online trans people really don't have a strong sense of conviction in their own identity, which is why they need constant external validation to prop them up. They need to constantly be told that they're valid, that they really are the gender that they say they are. It's probably fair to say that ContraPoints, with her millions of viewers, also qualifies in a way as an extremely online trans person. Importantly, today, compared with, let's say, 20 years ago, actually most people, including myself, are extremely online. The extreme has become the new normal. So in an extremely online life, which is now normal for most people, validation is increasingly crucial. This is also a big part of the rise of profilicity. And in profilicity, how the body image is seen as is also very crucial. ContraPoint says. But I'm not like, oh yeah, I have tits now, that's so hot. I mean, it's kind of hot. But it's more about other people being into it than it is about me being into it. 
how the body profile is being seen contributes to one's gender identity being serious. Here's an interesting expression of one of ContraPoint's most pressing concerns. I'm afraid that people will never take me seriously as a woman, hence ruining any chance I have at happiness. For her, to be taken seriously means to be taken seriously as a woman. Only this produces for her happiness. To be taken seriously as one's gender is crucial to be able to be truly invested in one's profile. Happiness is produced by being taken seriously as one's gender. Only in this way can one be truly invested in one's gender identity. You become your gender by successfully creating a gender profile and then by being able to be truly invested in it and this can make people happy. My view is well expressed by Catherine McKinnon. I always thought I don't care how someone becomes a woman or a man. It doesn't matter to me. Anybody who identifies as a woman, wants to be a woman, is going around being a woman, as far as I'm concerned, is a woman. Identity is achieved by identifying as, in the sense of successfully profiling as. In this regard, it's really important to signify to display signs as part of one's profile. We're using a cultural language of feminine signifiers to prompt others to see us for what we are. Identity is achieved once you have successfully prompted the general peer by the display of signs. He has a perfect short formulation. I'm presenting in such a meticulously feminine way. Again, there's a complete rejection of gender metaphysics. The point is not to authentically be a gender, that's impossible, but to present in a meticulously gendered way. Now here's a conclusion. What ContraPoints not just says, but what she does, successfully creating a gendered profile identity that is validated by millions of viewers, is gender identity under the conditions of profilicity. Transgender is a striking example of general gender identity today because here the incongruity, dissonance and non-identity that gives rise to and necessitates profile creation is very obvious. But any gender identity today can be shaped with the same identity technology. We can not only be transgender but also men or women under the conditions of profilicity. In the past, we shaped gender identity in conformity to social roles, female, male, or third gender. And many people still do this today. Then, in the age of authenticity, we pursued originality beyond gender. We tried to become who we are, not as woman or as men. But now, we increasingly realize that this is impossible. Today, a new gender identity option especially for billions of extremely online people, is the creation and true investment in a gender profile. None of these gender identities is more or less right or more or less correct. Gender is incongruent and contingent. No psychological or social concept of gender matches correctly chromosomal sex. There can be a painful dissonance or extreme incongruity between sex and gender. It's called gender dysphoria. As with all aspects of identity, we need to be able to successfully identify in terms of gender to form a sense of self. However, an existentialism of the 21st century recommends not to over-identify with one's gender, not to become a gender fundamentalist. One way of over-identifying with one's gender is to overcommit to gender congruity and to submit one's body to invasive medical regimes to better fit a given gender profile. Such regimes can be psychologically and medically dangerous. They are not limited to any specific gender. Cosmetic surgeries, for instance, are applied by all genders today to create a gender profile. Instead of over-identification, we can exercise genuine pretending. 
on the one hand being truly invested in a valid gender profile, but on the other hand understanding that there is no true gendered self. Reject gender metaphysics and theology. All right, that's it. Get them a son, get them a son.